And thank you, everyone, for coming tonight um, on this uh, really hectic week. It's nice to, to still get to be doing um, some of the work that I love the most, um, which is the work of interrupting oppression. Um, uh, what I hear a lot at the university is that a lot of uh, students say that we spend the most, most of our time um, learning how to critique and problematize our culture and society, but nobody ever tells us what to do about it. Um, and I kind of, um, I recently heard that one of the students considers this work of interrupting oppression the antidote to that kind of um, ailment of just problematizing. Um, we do want to think of ourselves as activists many times and as people who can um, uh, invoke some kind of uh, change and use our own agency to co-create social change, so um, positive social change. So that's what this work is about. So um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we're going to do tonight, and then I'm going to talk about some of the strategies to kind of keep our space um, the healthiest and function most functional it can be. Um, and then I'll be asking some questions of our participants and um, of these participants and then of these participants and we'll, we'll keep moving back and forth. So um, I appreciate um, you showing up and I'm excited to be in this with you. Um, okay, so tonight um, is super exciting because it is about the antidote. So, um, so what we're gonna do is talk about some practical skills and strategies for interrupting. Um, when I talk about interruptions, I don't necessarily mean um, when someone's talking and someone else um, talks over them. Um, what I'm talking about is um, interrupting in thinking, also um, an interruption in the dominant paradigm. So, um, so um, I like to think that we all have the ability to have consciousness around what's happening in, um, in these systems and, um, and we have the ability to, uh, to, to make a difference in the ways that we talk to each other about it. So that's what this is about. So what is an interruption? An interruption is an opportunity to have a dialogue about the experience of oppression in our lives. So that's kind of the definition that I've um, found the most useful in this work. Um, the other thing I want to say is that it is something that you've probably done before or you do regularly. So I'm not here to teach you all about how to do something extra special that you don't already know how to do. I'm here to be in community with you around what strategies work best, where we get kind of, um, uh, where we run into obstacles and barriers in doing that work and, um, and how to um, really cement in our own consciousness the practice and the idea that this is what we do, this is, and this is our commitment to doing that, and it looks all these different ways. The other thing I want to say about um, interruptions the way that I've um, conceived of them is that it's all about consciousness and relationship. So that doesn't mean that every interruption has to be good and every in interruption ends up in a positive relationship, but it is about relating to another person. So whether, however that ends up is, is kind of something that we will consider as we create um, and craft our own techniques um, and styles and we consider the, the kinds of outcomes we would like to draw forth in these kinds of conversations. So, so those are um, three things I like people to kind of know and understand. Okay, so um, the next thing I'd like to say is when we do talk about um, the concept of um, interrupting the dominant paradigm, we are often talking about something that makes us feel nervous. Also vulnerable, also um, trepidatious. If we had a formula and a strategy that was already laid out before us, then we would just do it and none of that would be true and also oppression would be over. And I can't wait for that day, but we're not there yet. So until we're there, um, it's good for us to create um, some strategies to be successful together. So um, I have a little list of six items that I'd like to share. And um, I would like to also offer the floor for people who want to add things. Um, okay, so strategies for success. The first one is uh, respect. So mutual respect. Just everybody came here to try to, to work on this together and that's amazing. So we just wanna keep coming at that, um, at this in an as open way as we possibly can. Um, sometimes people ask me, why don't we say safe space here? Um, and I actually um, never use safe space as a strategy um, because I feel like it's a setup. Some of us actually don't ever feel safe. 
for lots of ideas uh, or lots of reasons based on identities that we occupy. So I don't want to set us up, I just want to strive for mutuality and respect as much as possible. Um, the next one is to think well of each other. Oftentimes when we're talking about oppression, we're talking about our guts and humanity, and we can really get um, really upset. Um, and if we can think well of each other, know that people only know what they know until they know something different, um, it will help us to breathe. It also works on the freeway. So just saying, if I get cut off, I'm like, okay, well, they're in a bigger hurry than I am. <laughs> and then I feel a little less rageful. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, okay, um, number three is listen and support. So if we can listen to each other all the way out, hear each other all the way out, and then try to support the other person, and we can, um, when we do our group work, we'll, that will help us go further as well. Uh, the next one is a lot, um, th these, these previous ones are a lot easier with the fourth one in mind, I think, which is um, to be responsible for our intentions. So I know if I mean well or not. Um, I know when I don't mean well. So I want to be responsible for that. Um, and accountable for our actions. So sometimes I mean well, but my actions or the impact is not so great. Um, and so that's a really good opportunity for me to accept some feedback and to um, change my actions the next time and to say I'm sorry and to say I'm going to do that differently next time. Um, oftentimes, really, really well-meaning people do things that, don't, that, um, that are hurtful without having know, known that that's what's happening. Um, and because that happens, um, we want to provide opportunities for accountability in that um, so that people can change and can grow and we can build a collective that is interested in co-creating positive social change. Um, number five, with that, oppression hurts everyone. So we need to recognize that oppression hurts everyone and it's not a competition. Sometimes we get in the oppression Olympics, but that actually serves the dominant paradigm, which is divide and conquer. So then we're all fighting against each other, trying to um, have it recognized that our pains are worse than someone else's pains. Um, and then we don't actually get anywhere. So if we just recognize it hurts everyone, okay, I'm gonna validate that, and I'm gonna validate my own, and we're gonna keep being in this together, it will make a difference for us. Um, and lastly is love. So I say this um, as someone who's a mushy human, who is completely and totally, utterly, interested in love. Um, but I also say this as an academician as, and as an activist um, who studies love and, and I think of it as a strategy. Um, it's a nonviolent strategy, it's a transformative strategy, and it's something that we can use to change the energy and the ideas around um, an oppressive dynamic. Um, so I would say love yourself, love each other, and love your presenter. So I handed out a little worksheet. Um, so it has um, some definitions. Um, and these are some textbook definitions that, um, that are, are useful for us in many ways. Um, they are also um, a little bit uh, much. So, <laughs> so which is, is fine. I mean, it's not anything that we, we can't um, tease apart and make sense of, but it's also um, sometimes in a moment where we are having an opportunity to dialogue about the experience of oppression in our lives. There's all these feelings that come up, there's all these ideas that come up, there's a whole bunch happening in that moment. So it's really nice um, to be able to be like, okay, is this oppression or not oppression? What's happening here? Um, and so, so this definition, oppression is a pervasive system of social inequality woven throughout social institutions as well as embedded within individual consciousnesses. This term encapsulates the fusion of institutional and systemic discrimination, personal bias, bigotry, and social prejudice in a complex web of relationships and structures that shade most aspects of life and society. Um, that's a lot. So what I like to do if I'm trying to understand if something is oppression or not is I like to just kind of apply this lens. 
So, um, so embedded in this definition are these three big ideas. One is that is this moment um, of conversation, is it um, the way that I know that it, whether it's supporting oppression or not, is, is this idea institutionalized? So is there a systemic and systematic pattern that runs through all five institutions of society? So the five institutions are education, government, economics, religion, and family. Um, also, sometimes people use uh, media and health as well. So, um, so is this, um, this conversation that we're having, is this supporting, this idea supporting um, an imbalance of power among these institutions? That's what I want to know. Um, the other piece is, um, if, if those two things aren't showing up for me um, in a very clear way, I also want to know if it's part of the national consciousness. So is this part of, is this something that, um, that we kind of, um, I always say that the national consciousness is the thing that we know before we know the thing we know. You know? You got that? So it's like, um, it's, it's like all these um, little uh, prejudices and biases and um, things that we, we don't even know that we have taken on um, until we really kind of pan out and examine them. That's, those are the things that, are, that I'm thinking of. So, um, so why is this, this important? Because this is kind of big and up here, is that this stuff is often enacted um, in, a daily, in daily moments called microaggressions. Um, and microaggressions are brief, commonplace, daily verbal, behavioral, or environmental indignity, indignities, whether intentional or, or unintentional, that communicate hostile, derogatory, or negative slights and insults. And we can have a gazillion of them every day. Technical figure. So we, many of us in our identities can experience multiple microaggressions every single day. And um, because that is, that is happening, that has a really profound effect on the way that we feel like we get to show up in the world and the way other people around us feel like they get to show up in the world. How much agency they feel like they have, how much right they feel like they have, how much, um, how much goodness they feel like they have access to. And so I feel like we can figure out how that's showing up, have some conversations about it, and then we can change the way that we talk to each other, which will start to help shift that dominant paradigm. Um, Gandhi used this uh, notion of um, right thought, right speech, right action. And so I feel like our opportunity of interrupting microaggressions is um, in order to influence oppression in a positive way, meaning dismantle it, change it. Um, is, is that same path. So we start to examine our own thoughts. We examine the ways that we speak to each other. That's that interruption piece. And that informs our actions. It informs the choices we make um, with the things we buy, the, things, the people we talk to, um, the, the jobs we take, the people we hire, the policies we make, all of those things. So we think it, we speak it, we act it. That's the idea. So, um, so we are also um, socialized to support and perpetuate microaggressions, to support and perpetuate an oppressive system, unfortunately. So it's important, I think, for us to figure out what's happening there when we could have the opportunity to say something and we don't, and what's happening there when we do have the opportunity to say something and we do and it goes really brilliantly, and when it goes really terribly, and all of the nuances um, that accompany those moments, um, and how we um, can strengthen our ability to be in those moments together, collectively. So that's, um, that's what our work is about tonight. So let's talk a little bit about how it feels, because my assumption um, is that we've all, we've all done an interruption before. Are we clear about what an interruption is? Yeah? So opportunity to dialogue about the experience of oppression in our lives. So we're going to talk about a little bit about 
some of the feelings because I think this is, uh, I mean, I'm a feely person, so that's part of it. Um, but I also, I'm, I'm, I'm constantly trying to ask myself, okay, why didn't I just do one? What was, what was that about? How was I feeling? What, what happened there that I missed that opportunity to have that dialogue about the experience of oppression in our lives? So, that's, um, so it's good for us to kind of um, interrogate our own, our own experiences in that. So I'm just going to ask this group to give, me, um, to give me five feelings that may come up. So how does it feel um, to be interrupted? So if you have said something that was oppressive, which um, the other thing I want to say is, it's really good to have a compassionate lens in this because we are steeped in oppression and we are all culpable. So we all have had opportunities to participate in a system where we have said things that support and promote a system of oppression. So, um, so it's good to consider what it would mean to be interrupted for ourselves. So, um, so how, would it, how would it feel to be interrupted? Stasha. Um, grateful and guilty. Okay. It's like the double whammy feeling. Yeah. Once. Can you um, flesh that out just a little bit for me? Yeah. I had a conversation with a friend the other day. I mean, it's the complexities of the internet. But I had said something, and immediately he jumped on it and was like, ah, have you thought about this, 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 and this? And it was my immediate reaction, like, I'm just gonna take it down and I'm gonna be ashamed and I'm just gonna put this over here and we're gonna act like you didn't say that and then I'm gonna go into my bubble. Um, <laughs> you know, but I didn't, I left it up and we actually had this whole dialogue, which, you know, ended up being really good because I was really glad that he called me out because it just hadn't been on my radar. Yeah. But there was that immediate, like, crap, that's not what I meant to say, let me just, let yeah. me just eat it back up, like. <laughs> Well, and one of the, like, the sweet things about understanding it um, and accepting an interruption with gratitude is that um, many times it is a gift. If someone feels close enough to us that they could have a real conversation with us about, about oppression and wants us to, to think about how they can enact this kind of work with us, then that's a really awesome present to receive. So, um, so I... I, I'm with you in the gratitude part. And that doesn't mean that we're not going to feel guilty and be like, oh, I tried to do this work and then here I am. Foot in mouth. Mm -hmm. so, okay. Other, yeah. Um, reminded and reconnected both come to mind. And they're about remembering where I am in relation to all of the other people in my, my global community as well as my local community and reconnected with that complex network um, in a transactional way and being aware of what that connection means. Yeah. For sure. Awesome. Okay. So long time interrupters. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think yeah. a couple that comes to mind just from these are uh, shameful. I think there's a difference between guilt and shame. And also overwhelmed when being interrupted. I'm like, oh there's so much there. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, do you want to talk about the difference between guilt and shame? Okay. Or do you want me to talk about My it? My geekiness with Brene Brown. <laughs> um, the way that I remember it, Brene Brown has a talk on shame and vulnerability, but the difference between guilt and the example that she used was uh, it's I'm, I'm sorry I made a mistake versus I'm sorry I am a mistake. And so, uh, often operating in that. Uh, understanding of like I am mistaken internalizing it which is another form of oppression yeah and you know when we get caught up in this moment of I am a mistake or I am bad we often um, it will often create an opportunity for us to continue colluding with the system because there's no that's a kind of a, a monolithic space to occupy there's no movement there um, when we are in this space of I'm bad, then there's, there's nothing that can be done. You're just bad. If I've done something bad and I can figure out how to rectify that, I can figure out how to do it differently next time, I can, I can engage in some kind of um, uh, reparations in some way possibly, there's something that can be done, um, that's a different, that's, that's that guilt feeling sometimes. Or also accountability would be another feeling that could be uh, considered in that. 
I'm not overwhelmed, just like, wow, that feels overwhelming. I, you know, I was just trying to talk about my day, and then here I am getting interrupted. So, um, so it's like, whoa. Um, so that, um, that definitely, um, I think, is, I mean, they're all legitimate feelings, but, you know, I, I identify with that one as well. Any others that come up that you want to? Mindless. Yeah. Mindless. Uh, like a lack of mindfulness. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Just okay. like, oh, wow, I let that put an off moment. I really wasn't being mindful. Yeah. So what are some, so what are some other experiences that are out there? I think another really important one can be defensive. Defensive. Mm -hmm. Oh, I think, I, I know for myself, like if I'm getting interrupted by somebody that I'm that I don't like already have that community with, like my immediate response is, like especially if it's someone someone that's never interrupted me before, I'm like, what do you mean? And then I yeah. have that moment of thought, but that it's that immediate like jerk yeah. reaction of absolutely, absolutely. Like I didn't say that. Like <laughs> what? Yeah. Um, people to me are always more important than words. They're just like, if we have to have hierarchies and I need to rank things, I always put humanity, humans, before a label or a word. So if it means that whole groups of people will feel valued and validated if I remove this term, okay, perfect, done. So, it's, so that's kind of my, often my response when I'm having that, that moment of being kind of bewildered and enlightened simultaneously. I'm like, okay, that's a good, that's a good way to think about things. As, um, because we do get attached to different terminology and different ideas about how we frame things and talk about groups of people. And, um, and if I can remember that, then, then I'm far more grateful and enlightened in these moments. Um, let's talk about how it feels to interrupt. That's our other, because, so we've been talking about like how it feels to receive an interruption. There's a lot of feelings there. How about, how does it feel to be interrupted? How does it feel to interrupt? Someone has already said uncomfortable and scary, which is so true. Risky. Risky. Do you want to say more about that, Brian? Uh, sometimes I, I find that it was hard enough just getting into that space, um, let alone risking my ability to continue being in that space um, or being othered or something like that. Yeah, yeah. So if it's a moment when you're doing an interruption about perhaps an identity that you hold dear, or it's about, um, or you're just in your identity trying to have a conversation with someone that maybe isn't in your identity. It can feel risky. It can also feel risky if they are in your identity but you feel close to them and you don't want to lose them. There's all kinds of uh, potential risks associated with that moment. Oh, yeah. um, invigorating and intimate. I feel like both it, it it brings all of this nervous, excited, scared, angry, whatever energy to the forefront and brings it to sort of a peak that gives me the wherewithal to go forward with having the conversation instead of letting that come out however else it would come out. Mm -hmm. And it also feels like I'm plunging into a more engaged and deeper relationship with whoever I'm talking to, be it the person on the bus next to me or my coworker or my family member. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, because it's the real stuff of our lives yeah. when we're talking about it in this way. And I often think about this opportunity to present this gift as as a moment for us to become closer because if we don't have that, have that experience together, then, um, then I have potentially written the other person off as, being, um, as lacking the capacity to receive an interruption. So I've made my own elitist judgment about whether or not the other person can hear me. 
That's a possibility. Um, and the other thing is that um, sometimes I will interpret my own opportunity to interrupt as, as the moment where, there's a, uh, where there is a transgression, um, negating the fact that the transgression has already occurred if there is something that needs to be interrupted. That's the initial point of transgression. So if I just write that moment of interrupting off, then I'm, um, then I'm saying they can't handle it. I'm also, um, I'm also kind of neglecting my own compassion for my own self, my own commitment to social justice, my own commitment to the people I love, in my, uh, my own commitment to my own um, empowerment and my own identity, all of those different places. So, um, so there's a lot going on there um, in terms of it being an opportunity for a gift and an intimate moment. Um, Danielle, you had something too. Uh, I think sometimes it can be messy. <laughs> messy. <laughs> and sometimes, hopefully, more often than not, heartfelt. <laughs> That's my hope, too. <laughs> um, nerve wracking and invigorating. I'm kind of a nervous person, just in general, and so. I think a lot of when I go into interruptions, it's like the yeah. kind of that like bubble up effect. Mm -hmm. And so, <laughs> yeah, uh, pretty much until it's over, like I'm just like just have all this nervous energy it. going yeah. into it. Yeah, totally. And then, yeah, there's like, there's like almost like the high of interrupting, like that invigorating. Yeah. 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 And there's this idea of like, oh my gosh, and there's been moments when I haven't been perfect in this work. And so they're going to bring back all those moments because they're going to remember and then they're going to call me a hypocrite and it's going to be this really embarrassing thing. And it's this whole thing. Um, you know, I, I hear that a lot. I think it varies from person to person based on a whole bunch of factors. Um, what identities we occupy, so what our social location is, our race, class, gender, uh, sexuality, ability, all of those things have an impact on how much comfort we have in doing interruptions. Um, so, so all that stuff, um, whether or not we identify as an introvert or an extrovert, those elements also um, come into play. Um, and I, I want to say that there are particular ways that I talk about doing interruptions a great deal because um, there are ways that I'm familiar with because I've been really committed to doing this work for the last 15 years. Um, and I've done at least one interruption a day for the last 15 years. So I've done thousands of interruptions, thousands of them. Many times it's with myself, <laughs> but <I'm, laughs> I, because we're steeped in this system and it builds compassion and empathy, um, and, but I've done thousands of them. And so, um, so I have particular methodologies that are really effective for me, but I'm also a particular kind of person in a particular kind of way at a particular kind of time. So I want to say that um, I will give ideas and examples that work really well for me, but they, are, they work really well for me, and I'm happy to share that stuff. But I also want to say that this is about cultivating your own consciousness around your own practice and really starting to figure out what are the barriers that are showing up for me. I mean, you know, these moments of like, I'm noticing that I can interrupt strangers, but I can't interrupt my favorite people. So what's that about? And, you know, and try, kind of asking ourselves those questions, you know, doing a little writing, you know, having real dialogue with our community before something even happens, you know, like, hey, I went to this workshop. Isn't this interesting? I want you, you know, going home and saying to your, to your partners or to your, uh, your children, you know, I really want you to interrupt me. I'm, you know, I want, I'm committed to this. I, w I want you to interrupt me, and I'm, I'm curious if that's okay for me to do with you. How do, how do we want to engage in this? And so that we all begin to build our own kind of um, momentum toward this, this energy and this work. It can be a real moment of relief to be able to have that interaction where we're, you know, this thing has been happening over and over and over again, and then here I have this opportunity to say it in this way, and then I get to be heard and felt and known in this way. And then we get to be closer. And they get to say, oh my gosh, I really want to be respectful. I really, I really want that with you. 
So I'm going to, and I have my own, you know, best friends in the world who have, they're like, they call me and they're like, so I heard this thing. Is that interruptible? What do we do with that? And so we're all kind of engaged in this, like, in this practice together where we're just like kind of, you know, it's about um, curiosity, building our own consciousness around our commitment to social justice, and also um, being in relationship. Um, because not any one of us has all the answers. That's, you know, we really need all of us to kind of engage in these, these dialogues and build, build a consciousness around how to, how to relate to each other in this way. And I want to say that, you know, I'm, I'm here to um, create opportunities for us to think about interruptions with, um, with the kind of like delicious, juicy, fabulous outcomes that we want, you know, where everybody's like connected and not corrected and feels like with it and like really on it together. Um, but I have intentionally held on to the term interruption because it's, uh, this kind of phenomenon runs the gamut. There's a lot of different moments where an interruption will be, um, we'll be super angry. And the thing we need to say is hard and the other person is not gonna hear it in a way that we want them to. And it's, it's, a, it's a very profoundly yucky moment. And there's, so, we, I, so I have that in the terminology so that we have room for this, uh, the, the kind of spectrum, the vast spectrum of those moments. And, you know, my hope is that we're all considering what our own practice is in this. Some of us are, like, really frank and assertive. And that's just, we're just like, listen, this is, we don't have room for this. Um, we know people like that. Um, others of us, um, well, I often use what I call the uh, ham sandwich method, which is, um, it's only because I don't prefer ham. Um, but I love bread, and so I say something like, um, like kind and validating and delicious over here, and then I say that the thing that I think is going to be hard about what's oppressive over here, so the ham, and then I say something kind and validating and affirming over here, so I kind of sandwich it together. That's a method that I've used very frequently, and it's been very effective. Um, but there's all kinds of ways. Some of them are you know, real demonstrative and really loud, and some of them are quiet, some of them are in a note or an email, some of them are over Facebook. I mean, there's a million different ways. As many people as there are, there are methods for interruptions. So I, um, and my, um, my job isn't necessarily to, um, to judge all of the ways, but to say, like, let's get really conscious about the possibilities and let's think about cultivating our practice so that we are, um, we're following through with a commitment to do this, and we're finding other people who are also committed so that we can continue to be in community around that commitment. Um, so a lot of this part two is about looking, um, when we think about the feelings that are showing up, is, um, is to kind of help us understand that we have a lot of barriers to, um, to interrupt. I mean, there are, multiple barriers in multiple ways, um, and, and our, the feelings that we're having are also often barriers to, to doing this work. And so having, um, having an understanding of kind of the assumption that we're making about the other person's feelings, um, a recognition of our own feelings, um, and sometimes an articulation of our own feelings will help us to be able to um, build our practice a little more deeply. Um, and also I think a little more authentically I mean, there have definitely been moments when I've said, I feel kind of freaked out about talking about this, but I just really have to. Um, you know, when I do an interruption like three weeks after the fact with, you know, someone that I feel really close to, maybe a new person I'm dating or something like that, and I'm like, oh, I don't know how they're going to take it. This is going to be so weird. And then, and then we have that conversation, and then it ends up being um, something, you know, they know how I'm feeling, and so they're like, okay, well, let's, well, I recognize that this is a hard thing for them to say, so... I'll at least hear that part, and then we'll see where we go from there. And that, um, that makes a difference. So when we kind of are paying attention to some of the feelings, we can get really conscious about why we, why we don't and why we do, which is the next thing we're going to talk about really quickly. OK, so let's do um, So 
So if I can hear from, from our fishbowl about why we, why we don't interrupt. Why don't we interrupt? Because it makes us vulnerable in that situation, mm -hmm. which is both an asset and a deficit. Yeah, similar and yet different from that is that it's dangerous. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it can be dangerous. I know a lot of the time the situations that I don't interrupt are the ones that are actually physically dangerous or, you know, this is my boss or my boss's boss and this could either make work really awful or I could lose my job or things. Yeah. yeah. Those yeah. situations. <laughs> yeah. And I think it's really important to clarify here that we, that this work is not about, um, about saying like, every single time you have the opportunity to interrupt, you must do so. Um, it's about kind of assessing what's happening there and then considering your own practice, what, what will be the best strategy. Sometimes it just means being like, oh gosh, I wish I could interrupt and I'm gonna go home and talk to people I care about about what that would look like and what that means. Um, and really assessing the difference between discomfort and being unsafe. Uh, many, many times because of all of these intense feelings that are showing up in these moments, we, um, we will kind of conflate those notions of being unsafe and being uncomfortable. And it's really important for us to kind of get clear about, okay, am I actually unsafe? So it's my boss, it's my livelihood. Um, they don't really like to be talked to about this kind of stuff. Okay, <laughs> note to self, that is what I would consider an unsafe moment. Our livelihoods are important and we need to maintain them. Um, we might choose to look for another job or try to figure something else out, um, but that's, that's an important uh, consideration, distinction to make. There are other times when we're just like, oh, I just feel uncomfortable. Oh, that, I'm, that must mean I'm unsafe, so I'm not going to do it. If that's the truth, we probably would never, ever do an interruption because the vast majority of interruptions are uncomfortable. So that's another piece of that consciousness that's important, I think. Why else might we not interrupt? Uncomfortable should probably go on the list since we just talked about it a lot. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's not really very fun to be uncomfortable, yeah. usually, right? Usually. Um, being unsure, either of how to interrupt or unsure if the situation is interruptible. Yeah, so being unsure. That moment of like, oh, I'm not, um, I don't know if I'm an expert on this material. Um, so I, therefore, I have no right to say anything. So that's a, that's absolutely a reason that many people don't interrupt. They think, oh, I, I don't have the, the perfect articulation of this phenomenon. So I, therefore, I, I there's no way. Um, and I, I do want to encourage people to give themselves some, some breathing space in that and notice that, um, that that is part of the dominant paradigm, saying you have to be the perfect, you have to have the perfect intellect and the perfect words and be in the perfect way in order to have this perfect moment of an interruption. And I think it's very, very important that we, that we remove ourselves from that moment. Uh, this is a why and a why not, but because you love them. Because. Mm -hmm. So why wouldn't you if you love them? Because you don't want to lose them. Mm -hmm. Like if it's one of those, you know, whether it's, like there's, di there's those difficult situations that it may be a part of their identity, which doesn't mean it's not interruptible, but that still makes it, you know, it makes it risky. It, yeah. So I just want to say that many of the things that we, um, that we kind of, uh, came up with in terms of why we don't are fear-based. So it's, and fear is a reasonable emotion and feeling. Um, and many of the reasons that we came up with for the why are based in love. And so when I do think about that core value of how I want to operate in the world and how I want to make my decisions and what I'd like to do and what I would like it to be like for me, I think, am I going to operate from love or fear today? Sometimes I pick fear. Sometimes I'm really tired and things feel really hard and that feels like a reasonable choice. So this is not a judgment as much as it's a consciousness. So I have to say, okay, where, where am I coming from? What do, how do I, I want to operate? 
Um, and many times when I am operating from a place of love, I'm able to give that gift in a way that feels meaningful and compelling, and we feel connected instead of corrected in our interruption work. Corrected, um, connected, not corrected comes from my one of my favorite colleagues, Malia. Um, the other thing that comes from one of my um, favorite colleagues, um, Jennifer, who's not here tonight, is um, that an interruption is like um, an invitation to a social justice party. All you have to do is RSVP. And I love that um, because it is an opportunity to like to be connected and to think about how we can we can keep um, a momentum and an energy around what, what other new things can we learn? What else can we get curious about? What else can we do to change our practices, to change the language we use, to change the ways that these things are affecting us in these profound ways? Um, so the next thing I'd like us to do is um, think just, I'm gonna go over just a few strategies that I think are useful when I do interruptions, which is on the worksheet, and then we're gonna take some time to practice together. So I think that's, that's probably what we, most of us came for. So um, on the sheet that says Interruptions 101, there's, um, there are many, many skills. I'm just going to go over the kind of the first little section that I think are pretty useful and tell you about why, and then we'll, um, and then we'll start talking about our practice. So, um, so when I am about to engage in dialogue or conversation about the experience of oppression in our lives, um, these are the things that I'm considering. One, do I think well of the other person? Um, sometimes I interrupt for them, sometimes I interrupt for me, sometimes I interrupt for both of us, but some consciousness around that can be really useful. So if I, and if I think, you know, we're all steeped in this, and I give them a little grace, and then I'm able to have a conversation, my conversation usually goes a little better than if I'm just furious. Um, there's room for rage in this work, though. Sometimes we're furious. So, um, so that's an important thing to consider. Um, I also am always thinking about the outcome. So sometimes I want the person to hear what I have to say and be done, because I don't actually want to connect with them. So that's a relationship, but I'm hoping it's real short term. Other times, um, I'm hoping that this is a stepping stone, I'm part of the solution, we're, we're in connection, we're really going to keep talking about this for a long time. So how I think, think about them um, and that outcome matters. Um, I'm, I try to be patient. I try to know my objective and stay on track. So if I um, know that I would like to interrupt this thing, um, then, that, um, then I can often just say something, one sentence to interrupt. I don't necessarily have to give a whole lecture about it. Um, and that can be really helpful. Um, sharing new information. Many times people don't know. So they've never heard of this idea, or they've never heard of the ways that this affects people, or, you know, it's just new information. So just to say, like, hey, I just want to offer another perspective. I just want to give some new information here. See if we can incorporate this into our ideas that we have. And see what happens. If we're just curious, we're in relationship and we're using our consciousness. Um, demonstrating leadership skills. Uh, lots of us are in spaces where we have some kind of leadership position. So, um, and I think of that, that very broadly. I mean, I'm a mom, so I'm the leader in my house. Um, I'm also a teacher, so I try to be a good facilitator of those spaces. So there's a lot of different spaces where we um, are leaders. And so to have some, some skill set and to set an example and to take that to heart will matter in our practice because people will, will hear us in a different way. Um, uh, being aware of our nonverbal communication is important, like was offered earlier, kind of like our silence says a lot. So if we turn our back to someone, that, that might be a good interruption. It might be, might be a sad one. It might be a hard one. It depends. So we can, um, we can think about what our, um, what our bodies are doing when we're trying to have that conversation. That will help our work. Um, dialogue, asking some questions and having the other person talk back makes a big difference too. So we can have a conversation about it that will help the practice. 
um, follow our instincts. Sometimes the thing that was said isn't oppressive, but we're on such high alert, given our commitment to social justice, that the thing wasn't oppressive at all. So to be able to just ask some questions and think about it together um, is, is the right thing to do, but remembering that it's not about being right helps us to just get curious and keep having those conversations. So if we're not committed to like, oh, I have to be right, so I have to make this thing oppressive that they just said, even though it wasn't, that gets us all tangled up sometimes. So if we're just curious, we ask some questions, we have some conversations, we can get somewhere. Um, always, always, always be interruptible. That's another piece about being a leader and about being a role model and about, um, and about being in community is that we are able to receive interruptions. We're also able to interrupt ourselves there's a lot of, um, of language that we, um, one of our colleagues here tonight said, said that ableist language is something that we, we kind of have a lot of in, our, in the ways that we speak to each other. Um, and I am like really working on that. So I'm kind of um, getting tangled up in my language a great deal because a lot of the words that I use are super active. And um, so I'm constantly trying to consider how everyone could be included in the language that I use. So I'm, I'm interrupting in my head, I'm interrupting other people, or like, and I'm, I'm receiving those interruptions. And it makes a really big difference in our own practice if we're able to receive those openly. Um, so there's a bunch of other ones too, but we're not gonna go over those. You can just kind of like use them and think about them and also add your own because everyone has Great strategies, I'm sure. Um, the next thing I'd like us to do, and um, we'll do this in this group, and then um, I also like um, like everybody in here to turn to maybe get in a group of three or four, and um, I'll give you instructions, and then we'll we'll kind of get in, get into groups. But um, there are some scenarios. Some of them are just little things that people say that are seemingly innocuous but perpetuate and support microaggressions or oppressive language. Um, there are other things that people say that, um, that are pretty blatant um, and um, are all things, these are all things that I've personally interrupted. So, there, um, so I have a lot of practice and I'm sure that there are many more things that you could probably add to the list of things to interrupt. So, um, so I would like people to get into little groups and, um, and breathe <laughs> and also, um, also practice interrupting. So just kind of one of you will say the thing and then the other of you will interrupt. So find some that feel interesting, compelling, um, something that you would like to work with. <laughs> I can hear you. I can hear it hurting your guts all the way over I guess Rihanna does like the way it hurts. She's back with Chris Brown. Um, so, so what do you, what do you mean? I don't think anybody likes to be hurt. Right, but she... I, I get that that was like a clever joke, but what do you actually mean? Well, thank you. Uh, well, I mean, she's, she's back with him. She's choosing to go back to him. She, she's Rihanna. She's famous. She's got money. She can go wherever she wants. Um, okay, so what do you know about the psychology of like domestic violence situations? How much, how much work have you done in anti-interpersonal violence communities? How much work have I done? Yeah. Like, or like how much research have you What do you know about that kind of situation? I, I guess not a lot. Cool. Do you want to talk about that for a little bit? Because that's something that's really close to my heart and personal experience for me. Um, and it's, it's not as straightforward as I think it looks in the newspaper. So maybe having some personal experience um, or examples of personal experiences or like real talk, real people stories would help you kind of understand where she's coming from. Maybe that, that could be. Would that be okay? Yeah. Maybe. I guess not. Okay. All right. Cool. Oh. Solid. Solid. It's a hard. Yeah. It's I know so I gross to be the person saying the gross thing. So nice. Yeah. <laughs> 
That's cool. Good job. It was really Good thank job. Because it's really hot. I need to quit high with that hand. Oh, honey. Don't hurt yourself. Is it? No, like, got a half sleep face. My entire arm just hates me. You know what to do. Okay. I know. I think it was really solid. Well, and also, like, recognizing that that half the purpose of saying that it was to make a pop culture reference, like, it wasn't even about what they were trying to say. They were just trying to make the reference and be awesome. And I'm like, all right. I mean, like, I get, I see that. Well, we got to go somewhere else. Right. For sure. Well, and I like that you invited him into understanding more about it. But at first, I was also like, with the, like, well, what do you know? It seems a little like, um, intense in the interruption, but it, like the way the place you took it to, I really liked it. Because I know that sometimes it's like, oh, what do you know about that? can also be like off putting. Totally. And it comes off as elitist if it's not done with, like, yeah. But well done. I hope like, I didn't even want to touch that one. Um, so I just want to um, ask if there are questions or concerns or things that came up in your, in your strategizing, in your practice. I think being able to take some of these situations and being able to, you know, like we took ones that we were kind of struggling with, or I, I brought one up that I was struggling with, and being able to like problem solve that and have somebody else pay the play the person that was interrupted. Like, what would you do? I don't know what to do with this. What would you do with this? And like opening it up to our group and getting to kind of have everybody's input on that was really beneficial. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you know, this this is about, you know, taking these moments and saying, you know, the because oppression is systemic and systematic, we have these moments that happen, these microaggressions happen over and over and over again. So it, it behooves us to look at what, what's possible in this work and think together strategically about what kinds of things we might say, how we might, um, what kinds of scenarios might develop, how we might talk about the things we want to talk about so that when this happens, which it will happen, we feel a little more prepared. We were like, okay, like for me, I, um, because I've been doing this for a little while, I go, okay, I'm about to do an interruption. And I think that in my head and, I, and I, I wiggle my toes in my shoes. So I say, okay, I'm grounded and I'm gonna have this moment. Here we go. And that, that helps me to kind of like think about what all the layers are in my own practice. Um, because in order to get good at anything, we have to practice. And um, we kind of just hope that this will never happen, but we know that it does all the time. So why not just have it be a reality before us and own that that's true and then think about where our agency might come into play, where we might be able to actually do some good with this stuff. Um, and then that possibilizing and that practicing gives us the opportunity to be in this in a more, um, in a more intentional way. Uh, I think that this was really helpful because it's, there's so much emotionality connected to this work and this engagement with other people because it is like social interaction. Um, and so it was really helpful to have sort of the emotional potential run over explosion in a controlled environment, like practice, I don't know, yeah, yeah. literal practice bubbles, yeah. Um, but then also with going along with the minimizing um, discussion, what I found really helpful in one of the interruptions um, we did as a group was reminding the person I was interrupting that they brought whatever community we're talking about into the discussion and that I'm not inserting them there. That was already there. That's a great strategy. Yeah. Great strategy. So does that make sense? So the strategy that um, is offered is around when, when people are like, what are you even talking about that for? Kind of like, I don't even know what you're talking about. Um, you could say, well, you do know what I'm talking about because you actually brought this idea up. So I'm just commenting on the idea that was offered. So, it's, so it didn't come from nowhere. It came from somewhere because you just offered it. So now I'm offering something in return. So that's, 
so kind of, so there's ways of um, kind of uh, logically organizing our own anxiety in some cases around, around these moments as well, which is, can be helpful. Um, I just want to thank you for being here and being a part of this experience um, and um, say, you know, keep practicing. And uh, my email is listed on the sheet. So if you want to talk about um, ideas, um, I'm not the best at email, but I'm trying. Um, I know it's been years. I keep saying that. I don't know. Um, <laughs> But <laughs> I'm also on the PSU website with a phone number, so that's another place if you feel like you are trying to figure this out and want to have a little more dialogue about, about these constructs. Um, and I just want to say thank you for, for being in this with us. And have a great night. Have a great week. <laughs>